Jennifer Weiner to have you here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. I hope folks in the back can hear me okay. I'm going without a mic. Yes? So as Dr. Schmidt said, I'm Jennifer McCleary-Sills. I am the director of a global program on violence, rights, and inclusion at the International Center for Research on Women, ICRW. Our headquarters is in Washington, D.C., and we are turning 40 this year. So we've been celebrating all year round. You can check out the website at icrw.org. If you go in just a few weeks, you'll see a brand new website, though. So come back around November 11th. You'll see that it's new to celebrate our 40th. We're getting a bit of a makeover. But ICRW is a feminist research institution, as I said, headquartered in Washington, D.C. We have a regional office in New Delhi that covers our entire Asia region. And we have another regional office in Uganda, in Kampala, Uganda, and that covers Africa, where we do a lot of work in East Africa and Southern Africa in particular. So for more than 40 years, we have been the premier applied research institution on gender equality. We started in 1976 with a focus on women in agriculture, women in value chains, and have done some really important work to define these issues across the globe, looking at the agriculture challenge, looking at um, HIV-related stigma, looking at the increased risk that women ex and girls experience with respect to HIV infection. We've also done an enormous amount of work on child marriage, which I'll talk about a bit today, and then the core of my work, which is violence. So violence prevention and response, and that those are some of the flagship issues that we have worked on over the last 40 years. So today, I'm going to talk a bit about gender equality broadly. We'll take sort of a global lens. I'm not going to focus too much on any specific um, regions or countries, though there are a couple of examples that will highlight the issues in, in a regional or country-specific context. We'll talk about progress. We have a lot to celebrate over the last 30 years, but we're not even close to done yet. So that's your preview, right? Good things to celebrate, still some really important gaps, and we'll focus on those. I'm going to share a bit of a case study related to violence against women. Um, again, that's the area that I do most of my research on, so that's why I've chosen that for this. And then we'll talk about, again, some of the emerging work and evidence on the costs. These are social and economic costs, or impacts, of violence and exclusion. And then just some resources I would love for you to, to look at for further study and for more information. So I've got the slides prepared. I plan to stop so that we can have a conversation. But if you have a question midway, please feel free. I'd really love to, um, to hear what's coming up for you as I, as I present. So progress, right? These are the positive things. We go back to 1975, right before ICRW was created. And it is called, from 1975 to 85, is often called the decade of women. Why? The international agenda, meaning the United Nations and um, member states, were looking quite a lot at the issue of women and gender equality. There's been some important shifts in language over this 40-year period. At this time, it was women, women in development. We've now progressed to talk more about gender equality, and we can talk more later about maybe the philosophy behind that semantic distinction. Yeah? But it meant that there was more prominence in the international agenda, in agreements, in funding, in the way that countries and institutions like the UN were committing um, to development and ensuring that women were given, if not equal footing, but at least visibility that they hadn't previously been given. So you can see how an institution like mine would be born then around the same time. It was ripe. There was a specific focus on violence against women, linking that to development. It's something that we're still very much fighting to do and get at the right kind of um, attention. Also a focus on peace, the adverse of that, of course. We look at violence, conflict, gender inequalities, and how those are all linked. And um, recognition of women's rights. Some of the key moments in that period, maybe you've heard of CEDAW. So in 1979, that was signed by 170, 187 countries. Also, the General Assembly, that's of the United Nations, adopt a resolution on domestic violence. You can see that my focus is often on the domestic violence or the DV um, steps. Also, the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And in there, there's some um, specification of things like age of marriage, the right to be free of all forms of violence as children, right, including early marriage and, of course, sexual violence. And then a very important, a watershed moment for us in 1994, ICPD. 
Has anyone heard of this conference before? It happened in Beijing. And so you might hear people that were there talk about it just as Beijing, 1994. An incredibly important moment where someone that you may have heard of actually uttered the phrase, women's rights are human rights, and human rights are women's rights. That was Hillary Clinton. So ICPD, watershed moment for the gender equality movement in development. And it's something that we still um, refer back to. In fact, to, in 2014, there was a lot of attention given to ICPD plus 20, Beijing plus 20. In other words, how have we done? We made all these commitments 20 years ago. How are we doing? You'll see the answers now. There's been some great progress in education. Um, and I don't expect you to be able to read each of these, but the idea here is just to show that in primary education, we actually have done incredibly well in terms of enrollment. Girls' enrollment had been previously much, much lower than that of boys. We've evened it out pretty well, right? So you can see here, basically what you want to do is see, are there dots on either side of the line that are fairly even, right? Because the boys' enrollment is on this side and girls' enrollment here. Girls are still disadvantaged, but we've made huge leaps there. Now, that doesn't account for completion or quality, but enrollment. Secondary education, enrollment gaps are dwarfed by gender gaps. Girls are still disadvantaged, but again, we've closed the gaps pretty significantly over the last 20 to 30 years. Tertiary education is different, though. So that means places like this, right? University enrollment. In fact, women are more likely to participate than men. Now, these are global figures, so it is taking an aggregate. It doesn't mean that in every country this is true. But you will see, for example, um, I don't know if you can see the colors very well here, but Latin America and the Caribbean is green. If you were to take a closer look at this, and you will be able to after the lecture, you'll have the slides, you can see that there's a lot more green on the side of women's enrollment. So we see that in the Caribbean, for example, women are much more likely to enroll in tertiary education. So what had been a, a gender inequality that advantaged men is actually flipped, and now men are disadvantaged. Okay, so that's what we've seen in progress for education. For health, there are a lot of ways that we could look at this, and I know that many of you are interested primarily in health issues. Here are a few of the ways that we cut it when we try to understand what progress we've made. And this is since 1960, so it takes us back a little bit. Increased life expectancy. So you'll see that women were always a little bit higher, right? 54 in 1960, and now globally 71. 51 for men in 1960, and globally now 67. So you see that there's improvement there for both men and women, but it's a bit of a better improvement than for women. We've also seen rapid fertility decline. Again, global numbers, so this isn't the same in every country, but we've tried to take the aggregates here. I should mention the source of this, the World Development Report the World Bank puts out from 2012, and that was focused on gender equality. And I've got the, the citation for it at the end, so you can see that. But looking at fertility decline from five children per woman to two and a half births per woman, that's a significant change. But when we look at a country like the United States and we try to see how long did it take to cut from five to two and a half, or here from six to less than three. They've cut the numbers a bit differently. But it took us 100 years in the United States. And you can see that there are other countries that have had similar decline, but in a much shorter time span. They started a bit later, but have more than caught up, right? In Iran, you can see that they have the smallest um, period to get that sort of fertility decline. So it's progress. Why is fertility decline important? We know that women who have more children than their bodies can handle end up with a lot of other health issues, right? So they're having them too early, too often, without proper spacing between them. It affects many aspects of her own health, not to mention other development outcomes. But from a health perspective, we know that declining fertility is actually a good thing for women's individual health and for the health of the babies. Uh, is there any discussion on how it happens so much quicker? Yes. Yes, so the question is, why did it happen so much more quickly here? The yes, the question is, why did it happen so much more quickly here, for example, in Iran than in the U.S.? I think a lot of it does have to do with the timing. So if the U.S. started 100 years ago, the technology available was quite different. We didn't have modern methods. We didn't have such effective methods of contraception. 
right? And so if you're beginning, what do we have here? 10, 15 years ago, all those methods are available. And also, it's sort of catching up to the progress in conversations and laws and access. So it's technology as well as perhaps shifting gender norms. And is that also then related to like government level policy or is it more internal? Or yes. Um, the question is, is that also related to government level policy? And I think the answer is yes, although this analysis does not account for policy. Okay. It doesn't really say, you know, which country had supportive policies on the books, but we do know that to the surprise of many, Iran has had relatively progressive laws when it comes to contraception. Not some of the other things that we'll be looking at, right? Bangladesh as well, Morocco, and then, you know, these were a little bit slower. India um, is one of the countries that has had abortion legal for, I think, 30 or so years. Um, they've also had, you know, challenges there with sex selective abortion. And so, Right here, we're just talking about the number of children born. It doesn't necessarily mean that in of itself it's been all positive. But to say where women seem to be getting a little bit more control over the number of children that they have, the health outcomes multiply from there for them and for their children. So that's health. Labor force participation. Again, we're cutting the numbers here a bit differently. This is also from the WDR, the World Development Report, since 1980. What you should see here, and the take-homes, the gender gap has narrowed. That's great, from 32 percentage points to 26 percentage points. But that still means there's a 26 percentage point gap, right? So it has closed, but it still exists. We know that now women represent about 40 percent of the global labor force. Here we're looking at the national GDP per capita and female labor force participation. And basically you see that it's, you know, it's a good thing. The GDP is higher where women are participating. Notice that the curve really begins here at 1980. So you can sort of ignore things to the left of it. That's just to normalize the curve. Yes. Sure, so I just read them each, but this is GDP per capita in constant U.S. dollars of two th from the year 2000, right? What's the vertical? This is female labor force participation rate in percentage. So this is 80% is the highest, but really if we look at 1980, it's around 60%. Here, it's about 70%. Here. So we, c we can come back to it to talk through it, because I think that this one it re probably requires more explanation of the curve, but the idea is that the curve has been normalized. It's a log as well, so they don't represent actual dollars, right? We're not talking about eight or 10,000, right? It's all been normalized. Um, the idea here, though, is that as they've labeled it, I think, a bit confusingly, female labor force participation has increased over time at all income levels, but the income they're talking about really is GDP. Yeah, they're not talking about individual incomes. Yeah? So this is labor force participation. We'll see the, the inverse or sort of the but of this that shows us this is a good sign, but it's still not enough. Another place that we've seen progress is on attitudes about violence against women. So you'll see me using this shorthand, violence against women. We've seen attitudes changing. Now, there are surveys that are done every five years or so in a number of countries around the globe, funded by the U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID. Um, those surveys are called the Demographic and Health Surveys. If you've not read them, they should be your friend if you want to get a sense of what's happening in different countries around the world. They allow you to do a lot of really interesting comparative analyses. Um, this comes from the book Voice and Agency that I wrote with colleagues when I worked at the World Bank. And what we looked at here is in total about 55 countries, and these are giant data sets of 10,000 women or so. But we took some of these that had asked over time, so the earliest available year for the DHS and then the latest available year for it, they asked the question, do you think it is acceptable for a man to beat his wife if she argues with him, if she goes out without telling him, and if she refuses to have sex with him? There are other situations, but these are the most common. They're ones that are repeated in all of the surveys. So what you would like to see is 
answers closer to the zero, right? These are the percent of people in the survey who said, yes, it's justified. If we look at the orange, though, the latest year available, we also want to see that the orange is to the left of the blue. Does that make sense? Right? So the, the earliest year, maybe more, this looks like something around 70% said he was justified in beating her if she refused to have sex with him. In the most recent year, it had gone down. I don't know if that's about 50, 60%. It's a decrease. It's still too high, but it's showing progress, right? And that's kind of what you're hearing of all of these markers of progress. We're still not where we need to be, but we're going in the right direction. You see, it's not true everywhere. There are some places where they're right on top of each other, and in fact, here, it looks like it's going in the wrong direction, right? Some of them really layered. But overall, when we did the analysis, we see the trend that answering yes to any of these questions, it's decreasing over time. And some of these are five and 10 year spans. And these are asked of men and women, by the way. And there are a lot of women who will say, yes, it's justified. So that's some progress that we can celebrate, but not yet say we're done with. So as I've, I've said many times, right, there's been progress, but gender gaps still exist. We're still not at equality. So if we look at education, so we'll go back to the same examples as before. If you look at, again, to help you read it, orange line is for girls, the green line is for boys. This is income quintile, and this is median grade, right? So we're looking at kids 15 to 19. How, how long do they stay in school, basically? So we see that at every income quintile, and there are obviously five of them, that's why they're quintiles, um, even among the wealthiest, you see that there's a gap here. So this line represents the gap. You see that it closes in the Gambia and in DRC, here in Pakistan. In Togo, it's still quite open, right, in India. That the wealthier the family, for many of these countries, the narrower the gap. And in fact, boys and girls are just as likely to be in school and stay in school. Or teenagers here, 15 to 19 year olds, are just as likely to still be studying. Most schools end around age 18, like here in the US. So we see that gender and socioeconomic status are also important. Now we're starting to get into this idea of intersectionality. So we talk about gender inequalities, but it's not just gender that determines these gaps, that determines the inequality. So here, it's economics, right? If the family is poor, look at the size of these gaps, right, in the first quintile. They're all really big, yeah? Girls are much less likely to go to school when a family's poor. They're less likely than their brothers. So we could say all children are unlikely to stay in school if the family's poor, but the girls are much less likely than even their brothers in the same economic situation. Yeah? Yep. Um, in these uh, six countries, is compulsory education um, covered by the government, or does the family have to cover the cost? Yep. That's a very good question. So the, the question is, are, is, is um, primary education, or maybe even secondary education, paid for by the government? You said, is compulsory education covered? I'm not sure that it's compulsory in all of these. I can tell you, for example, countries that I know, like India, um, it is not covered. And school fees can be a real problem. So then you can see why, if you have very limited resources, why you might choose your boys to go to school over your girls. There's a, there's a problem there with the perceived value of educating a girl. Yeah, something we can talk about more. But I don't know if all of these countries have the same profile. I've also done work in the Congo, and school fees are a challenge there. So I don't know if it's compulsory, but it is not fully covered by the government, even at public schools. And sometimes it's the smallest fees. You have to buy your books, and you have to have a uniform. Even if you don't have to pay fees directly to the school, that alone can be enough of a barrier that you can't afford to go or to send your child. It's a great question, though. So that's where we are still seeing inequality in education, right? As I mentioned earlier, we have issues with the quality of education, which still can be very discriminatory toward girls, the safety of educational institutions that can make it very unsafe for girls to be there, particularly when we're talking about um, boarding schools, which are very common in, in lots of sub-Saharan Africa. So this is just enrollment and completion, not all the other issues that would make this 
an unequal um, opportunity for girls and boys. So again, back to labor force, and I know this is a pretty busy slide. It's 10 countries, and I think a key here, one third of the world's population is represented by these 10 countries. So it's some of the same ones we had on the previous slide, India and Pakistan. But if you look at the black dots, that's male labor force participation. It's a percentage, right? The darker lines is labor force participation. These are for women. Wage and salary workers is the, the lighter. And then the gender wage gap. So what you should be able to see here is that, for example, in India, men's labor force participation is well above 80%. Women's is down here, somewhere around 30. And we also see the wages are low generally, but women's are lower than men's. And look at the size of the gender wage gap. Any ideas why? What kind of segregation might we be seeing here? Yeah? Like the types of jobs. That's what the, exactly, the types of jobs, right? And we would love to say that in the United States, we don't have this problem anymore, but it's not true. So we've got the types of jobs that women in India and Indonesia, all of the other countries, including our own, which is not on here, the types of jobs, there's a segregation there that sort of automatically creates the disparity in wages. Did you want to say something else? Yeah, I just have a question. I'm curious why there's no data from the United States. It seems to me we're only talking about Asia and Africa. Yeah. Why do we have to look at the country? It's because it comes from um, the world development indicators which look at developing countries, developing economies. It would be interesting to see in both developed and undeveloped countries. Yes, it would be very interesting to see it in a country like the US as well, though, I mean, we have data that suggests the gender wage gap is still pretty big. We still are saying 70 cents to the dollar, right? For every dollar that a man earns, a woman is earning 70 cents. I understand there's a movement now to discredit that claim, but I haven't seen one that convinced me yet. So I agree. We, it would be nice to see how some of the um, developed countries and you know, developed economies compare, but I think we might just see a similar pattern, perhaps less severe, yeah? What I, th I would like for you to, to notice, though, again, you'll have the slides later so you can look at it more in detail, is that this bar, the wage gap, is mostly in all of the countries, it's the highest, right? So even where the labor force participation gap has closed, in other words, where women have joined the workforce in somewhat equal numbers to men, the wage gap is enormous. So we have a long way to go. And that is, as you suggested, about the types of work that women are often engaged in. Some of that could be by choice. Some of it could be by a segregation that happens at universities. Right? We're in a school of engineering right now. I was pleased to see some female students studying in the lobby. I was hoping they were engineering students. But some of it happens much earlier than that. Right? STEM programs that give girls the message that they really can't cut it in science and technology. So it can happen very young. In some of these countries, it might also be about the, the, the dual burden that the girls are expected to carry of doing work at home. So there are a lot of reasons that might help explain it, and it's going to be a little different for each of these countries. Yeah? Um, you, earlier, you said uh, women should have less education anyway. I think that probably is also another contribution problem. Yep, here. fair point. So she's linking the lower education level of girls, who then become women, to labor force engagement and the types of jobs. And you're absolutely right. So you can see those as being linked. If you take family economic situation and the country's economic situation, and then you take the education opportunities for boys and girls, we see the disparities there. So they all kind of multiply until you get to see something like this. Yeah? And health. Again, we talked about fertility before. This line, the average number of children. So we've got up to eight. And I know it's a bit faint for you to see, but this yellow line, that you see far to the right, that's the poorest quintile. So those are women in the poorest families in all of these countries. Again, the shapes are a bit different. Some of them are much more stretched out. The longer lines, like let's take, let's take, I think this is Angola, right? That's a pretty long line here. What that tells you is that income is a dramatic predictor of how many children a woman is going to have. Family income, not her personal income. So it's an important predictor. 
in the United States, look at how narrow that is, which means that income is not as important a predictor, family income, right? So again, these quintiles are based on the family socioeconomic status. But we still see the same shape everywhere, meaning that across the globe, irrespective of how developed the country is, we've also got Australia here, you're going to see that same shape, that women in the richest quintile have fewer children, and women in the poorest quintile have more children. Is that surprising? Are kids expensive? Yeah, it's pretty expensive. Yeah? That's, that's what I was just going to say. Like, maybe the people in the richest countries don't really want to use all their money on, like, eight different kids. Okay. So maybe wealthy families or wealthy parents don't want to use all their money on so many children. What else is an important predictor here, though? Yeah. Sending the kids to work. Sending the kids to work. Say more about that. Uh huh. So, what kind of families do you think need the kids to go work? Right? So, this is, it may sound a bit too simplistic, but a lot of families that work the land, that, you know, they live in agricultural societies, that their livelihood depends on the land being properly harvested. You need more kids to do that. It was the same here in the U.S. not so long ago, right? So, that would be one. I think one determining factor, do you need their labor? Yeah, what else? Oh, sorry, I was going to mention um, health and access to health care. Yes. Because if you're in a country that's very low income and you are poor yourself, the odds of you having a large amount of children surviving into adulthood is slim. So you can increase your odds of having more children, forming into the labor force by having more children. So you have made so many excellent points there, yeah. right? So access to health care. And you do see, as we've pointed out, that we've got poor countries, and then we've got a couple of um, pretty wealthy countries, the US and Australia. The patterns look different. So in a poor country, poor people are worse off. Right? If they're relatively poor for their country, they are worse off. They have even less access to resources than probably a poor person in a country like this. There's a survival question. Right? If I have eight children, I don't, but if I have eight children here in the US, the chances of them all surviving to adulthood are pretty high. If I have eight children in Niger, and these are births we're talking about, if I give birth eight times in Niger, the child survival rate is pretty low. So there might be that consideration. I want to have as many children as I can in the hopes that some will survive to adulthood so that they can contribute to the family. But there's another really important piece of the healthcare equation that determines this. Yeah, birth control, family planning, contraception, whatever phrase you like to use for it. Yeah? But poor women are often not as well educated, often live in more remote areas that don't give them access to something as simple as the pill. Or, as we'll see soon, we talk about violence, perhaps they are not allowed to access that and make that decision, right? So again, we see these overlapping deprivations. Again, we talk about intersectionality. So we see poverty, education level, gender, and how that all intersects then to increase risk. Yes? What about the cost of contraception relative to income levels? Yes, it, it can be huge. Now, in many of the countries here, there are large development programs that provide contraception free of charge. But that is, a, that's a provision, doesn't necessarily help them overcome the access issues, right? So there's a bit of a, a split then between the supply and demand. They can bring the supply to the country, maybe even get it to the clinics, but how do the women get to the clinics? So even if you can get, let's say, the pill, we won't even talk about some of the more expensive things, something as simple as the pill, if you can get it for free, that's great, but how do you pay for your trip to the clinic? Yeah? How do you get childcare? How do you get your husband to agree to let you to go? Right? Or perhaps your mother-in-law who might bar you from making that trip. How do you prevent the stigma that you might feel because you have gone and sought out this option? So there are a lot of different costs, but often the actual cost of acquiring it, the out-of-pocket expense for the method, 
is often covered. Increasingly, programs who recognize these gaps, right, between the, the richest and the poorest, are now doing what they can to bring the methods to communities, right? Training local women, not terribly well educated, but they can give them the basic information about which methods make sense based on what women want. Do they want to have no more children? Do they want to wait a while before having a child, right? So we're getting better on it, but you still see that these are big gaps. Okay, so that's fertility, and you can tell it's one of the issues I'm most interested in. Overall, when we think about voice and agency, and again, that's the name of the book that I mentioned before where we did some of these analyses, we talk about both of these things as basically meaning women have the right to make a decision for themselves and act on it without fear of repercussions or violence. So there are a lot of clauses there, right? But here, one of the ways that we measured it is looking at women having a say in household incomes, including their own. So again, the DHS, the Demographic and Health Surveys, they ask women, have you earned any money in the past 12 months? They ask about the past seven days. If they say yes, who decides how that money gets used? And you have a lot of options. It could be I alone decide, I decide in collaboration with my husband or partner, or he decides, or someone else. And so this is how we're able to get at these questions. Again, you see the blue is the richest women, the yellow is the poorest women, and the red line is an average. And you see a pretty similar, you see a pretty similar relationship here, right? So percent of women not involved in decision making. So you would like for this to be low. And in the richest quintiles, it is pretty low, relatively low. So wealthier women or women from wealthier families say that they are more involved in household decisions than poorer women. So again, as we think about these overlapping and intersecting risks, you see that poverty and education are some of the most important indicators for all of these other risks that keep gender equality live and well. Sorry, gender inequality. So violence then. This is a global stat. And I'm really proud of this figure because it's one that my team and I created for the United Nations as part of a video that maybe I'll send it along with the slides. It's maybe a bonus for you. It's a three minute video. But in the middle you see a woman we've called Sarah and she's meant to represent every woman. So one in three women worldwide has experienced physical and or sexual violence. Please take note of the asterisk, which I insisted on having put there. But what it means is physical or sexual violence by a partner. Again, the DHS surveys ask this question. Have you experienced any of these specific acts? Did your partner or husband punch you, hit you, kick you, choke you, threaten you with a knife, force you to have sex when you didn't want to? They're very specific acts that we're asking if he committed. One in three women, global average, said yes to any of those measures. When we look at sex, sexual violence by a non-partner, meaning someone you weren't in an intimate relationship with, it wasn't your boyfriend, it wasn't someone you were dating, that number goes up. And we're talking about 35%. So this is 30%. When we add in non-partner sexual violence, it's 35% of all women across the globe. It's pretty staggering. And to show you just how staggering it is, again from our book, Voice and Agency, we looked at regional averages. And when we did the calculations, we took that one in three figure for women across the globe. And again, these are looking at women 15 to 49 only. So you look at that and the calculation then suggests that for partner violence, physical or sexual, that is 700 million women. When you add in the non-partner violence, that is 818 million women who have experienced just those three types of violence, physical violence by a partner, or sexual violence by a partner, or sexual violence by someone who's not a partner, never was. 800 million women. What I find interesting about this map then, the colors don't mean anything, they're just there to define the regions. So, Europe and Central Asia, 29%. Here in North America, the data come from Canada and the US, a few studies, more than one in five. 
In a city like mine, Washington, D.C., you can actually see public service announcements that say it's higher. It's one in four. It's more like 25 percent. So it's important to note that these regional averages, they mask what's happening at a country level. It also masks what's happening within the country, right? So let's just take North America, 21 percent. Our number in the U.S. is probably being improved a bit by Canada. Canada's rates are a bit better, not dramatically so. But so if you look at any of the other regions, you'll see some of the countries would have high levels and other countries would have low. Within each of those countries, you would have some really um, very high prevalence communities or profiles. Again, think about the risk profile we've been building, right? Women with less education, lower socioeconomic status, more children, they tend to experience more violence, fewer decisions that they're able to make at the household. And so these are very broad, very aggregate figures that are useful for us, but they don't tell us the full story. One of the reasons they really don't tell us the full story is that um, it only talks about the prevalence, the women who were willing to say in a study, yes, I experienced it. It also doesn't tell us about all the impacts. So this is another, um, another infographic that we created for that same project. You could find it here, nvawnow.org. It's part of um, a global program that the United Nations has put together. But here, um, any of you who might have studied an ecological model or a social ecological model, I see some nods, good, okay. This should look familiar, just look at the bands here, right? So you've, you've got the survivor here, family, community, and country. In each of these levels, what we've tried to highlight are some of the documented impacts that partner violence has. Because there's a lot of documentation, we have an enormous amount of evidence about the way that physical and or sexual partner violence affect women, and their families, their communities, and ultimately even their countries. Impact on gross domestic product, lost productivity, and health sector costs. Those are some of the examples. Yeah? But it's only a very limited slice of the types of violence. Are there others? So if I just say physical violence by a partner, sexual violence by a partner, and sexual violence by a non-partner, what am I missing when I talk about the violence that women and girls experience? Yeah. Okay, verbal abuse, emotional violence, right? Which is absolutely valid, but not counted in these estimates. So also the impacts of it are not well estimated in those figures. What else? Unfortunately, there are so many. Yeah. Okay, physical violence by a non-partner, sure. Which may or may not be gendered. Right? It may not have a gendered um, dimension to it. So when we talk about violence against women, we're often talking about something that is happening to them because of gender inequalities, because they are seen to be lesser than males in their community or their society. But yes, often physical violence by another family member could be very much gendered. I s yes? I'm going to add in neglect. Neglect, okay. Economic violence. We would usually put it under that category, right? So neglect economic violence, you talked about sort of verbal abuse, which is emotional. Oh, there's such a long list. And this is not exhaustive. I'll give you a second to take a look at it. Does anything there surprise you? Have you heard of all of these? All right. I'm happy to come back if you want to talk about any of those in particular, but again, not an exhaustive list. Why do I share this? Just, to just as a reminder that the previous map, that 818 million figure that I shared with you, is staggering, but it doesn't include all of these forms of violence. So we're talking about something actually much bigger than even that, bigger than one in three. Child marriage is one of the forms listed on the previous slide, and again, if we think about this as a global issue, red would be the worst situation, with orange being only slightly better. You see this band, which is kind of a hot zone, unfortunately, for child marriage, which means being married before the age of 18. It, it's something that does happen to boys and girls, but significantly more frequently to girls for a lot of reasons. So even in the U.S., it's funny, we don't have it colored because we don't do a good job collecting this information, but child marriage is legal 
in many states in this country? Yes, it is. Some recent studies have actually shown exactly how common it is in places like Virginia, very close to where I live, and in Texas. Not that it's only those, it's just where the studies have actually been conducted. Yeah? So again, you see these pockets of bright colors. What I want to um, mention, a lot of people who know anything about child marriage think about India first, and then they're surprised that India is not red. The reason that India is often the first country people think of with child marriage is that it is home to the largest population of child brides. That's because of the sheer size of India. But the prevalence, so it's in this 41 to 50 percent range, is lower than the countries here in this band. But in terms of the absolute number of child brides, India, I would say wins, but it sounds like a dubious distinction. They have the highest number. We do know this too. Girls who finish high school are six times less likely to marry early. And those two risks are deeply intertwined. Many girls, millions of them, we're talking about 15 million girls around the world by recent estimates, many of them drop out of school because of marriage. Many of them will um, stay in school only as long as, you know, until they get married. But we also see the other side, that they were never really expected to finish school, and so they're just sort of waiting around for marriage. Or they drop out and then become uh, an easier prospect for a marriage. So those two risks, deeply connected. But we see six times less likely to marry early if you finish school, secondary school. I've mentioned these, one sec, I've mentioned these overlapping constraints before. And just to call your attention to the middle of this Venn diagram, this is 13% of women, this is again our global analyses, 55 countries, 13% of women experience all of these deprivations. Lack of control over household resources, they condone wife beating, and they've experienced child marriage. Basically half of the women in the world have experienced child marriage. They got married before age 18. Um, do you um, know of any statistics that display the facts of women who have been married against their will and not just under 18? Like yeah. Over 18? Yes. That, it's a really good question. So she's asking about the kind of a distinction being married against your will. We call it forced marriage as opposed to just child marriage. Now, a, a new phrase has emerged, child, early, and forced marriage, CEFM. And the, the community of, of us who do work on this issue would say that any child marriage is a forced marriage. If she's married before age 18, or if he is married before age 18, it is a forced marriage. That's a child who cannot actually consent to marriage. And if you look at international agreements like the Convention on Rights of the Child and on CEDAW, um, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it's very clear that if you're under 18, you're not an adult, you can't consent. So yes, we consider all of those forced marriages. The study I mentioned in the US that documented child marriage also looks at forced marriage. Um, I don't think we have global figures like on that slide for forced marriage. It's just child because it's easier to document that in a registry. How old were you when you got married? They don't follow up with, did you want to get married? Yeah. So again, the overlapping constraints. Um, I will go through this pretty quickly, but the idea of the health impacts of violence, and again, this is partner violence. This is from my own research. The, the citations are down there, so you can look them up later if you're curious. Unintended pregnancies, uh, for those of you who don't read odds ratios, don't be intimidated by them. If it's over one, it means there's greater risk. And if this is really small, like it is here, it means it's significant. It means the statistics are solid. So here, a 68% increased risk of an unintended pregnancy if you have violence in your relationship. Hugely significant, very problematic. So that's one of the clearest health impacts of violence. Low birth weight, again, it's a smaller magnitude, but just as significant. Preterm birth, pretty large magnitude and significant. I want to go to this one, though, family planning use. I was very disappointed in my own studies to find out that it wasn't significant. I expected that it would be the opposite direction, that this would actually be under zero, smaller, sorry, under one, smaller than one. Because I would expect that if you were in a violent relationship, you'd be less likely to be able to use family planning. This is from Jordan and also from a systematic review and meta-analysis that I did of many countries. It just didn't show up that way. 
This actually indicates that you're a little bit more likely, but it is not significant. So in other words, it's inconclusive. But can you think of why you'd be more likely to use family planning if you're in a violent relationship? I had to explain it to defend my dissertation. Yeah. Yeah, maybe you don't want to bring a kid into that environment. You don't have the means or the agency to get out, but you don't want to bring someone else into it. So with whatever agency you have, with whatever autonomy you can exercise, you use a method so that you won't get pregnant. There was a fascinating study that I read that said exactly that, and it was titled, Not With This Partner. So exactly as you suggested, right? And, and that made me feel better about defending my own dissertation. Now we want to talk about the costs. I'll give you a second to look at this. But blue, the costs of intimate partner violence. Again, we're talking about physical and sexual, so we're not getting to the emotional violence or the economic violence. And then the red is spending on primary education from the same book. You'll see this in Voice and Agency. Very different countries, very different models, unfortunately. So we put them on one graph, but don't take these as apples and apples because the models that they're built on are quite different. But what this means is, as a percentage of gross domestic product of GDP, Australia spends more than 1% because of intimate partner violence. And they spend a little bit more, well, 1.7-ish, on primary education. But look at some of these other countries. Bangladesh, much more on IPV than on education. Peru, much more than on education. Why do we do this? I do this work from a human rights perspective. I think you should want to prevent violence just because it's wrong. But a lot of policymakers aren't moved by that argument. So we give them a fiscal argument. Dear Minister of Finance, if you do not prevent violence in Peru, you're going to continue losing, three. I think it's 3.7% of your GDP. And that's more than you currently spend on educating your children. It's a shame on you moment that you're able to offer to these policymakers. You can do better. So we find that this can be useful for engaging conversations where the human rights argument doesn't work. So we are often doing these costs and impacts estimates. And it's part of the work that I'm doing right now as well in a multi-country study in Ghana, Pakistan, and South Sudan. We're trying to estimate the social and economic impacts. I'm getting to the end of it. So if you, can you hold your question? Another form of gender inequality that I just wanted to focus on is exclusion of LGBTI people, so lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and intersex people. Homophobia. And I would really encourage you to go to UNDP. They have this index that they um, released last year. Beautifully illustrated. You'll see a little couple bits of it now. But the idea here is, even if we take violence as a separate issue, and violence is a significant problem for LGBTI people in this country and in many others, discrimination is something we haven't done a very good job measuring. And the effects, the economic and social impacts of that discrimination, they're very severe. They're severe. So this is a study that I just love. And you can find it, again, online, a global barometer of gay rights. Much like the previous um, maps, red is bad. You don't want to be red. You certainly don't want to live in a red country if you identify as lesbian, bisexual, gay, transgender, intersex. I would suspect that the US might have moved just a little bit, because this is 2013 data. So with marriage equality now being the law of the land, maybe we've edged up a bit. But remember, we have a very big country, lots of different laws. Still, discrimination against LGBTI people is legal in many of our states. So maybe we didn't move from resistant to tolerant, but you know, maybe an edge forward. So the study that, um, that these folks did to create the barometer, basically it's a point system, looks at the policies, looks at laws, looks at how safe it is. And adding those points up, the safest places are protecting of LGBTI rights. Notice where they are, our neighbors to the north. And then along the spectrum from green to yellow, orange, and red, it gets worse as you go down. Most of the world is red. And again, where I've had conversations, whether from my time at ICRW or when I worked for a Christian development organization or the World Bank, the human rights angle is often not well received. So we take an economic approach. 
a case study that was done by Lee Badgett, who's at um, University of Massachusetts at Amherst, with the World Bank, looked just at India. Again, a booming economy, a giant population, and a country that, interestingly enough, recognizes a third gender. They have male, female, and hijra, which is what we would call a transgender woman, so someone born biologically male, living as a female. Whether or not an operation has happened, it's a third gender that is legitimate and recognized on national IDs. But it's still not legal to be gay. So that's a, an interesting disparity. But in India, this one case study showed that between a tenth and seven tenths of a percent of Indian GDP is lost because of discrimination. And we'll look at, in one second, the types of discrimination. The results can be health care costs because of homophobia, HIV disparity, depression, suicide. There are a number of other ways that this incurs impact and cost. It seems like a small number, but let's remember that India is an incredibly powerful economic engine. Look at what it equates to. 700 million, you know, maybe up to 23 billion. That's in one year. So again, if you want to say to the Indian government, you need to take the rights of LGBTI people seriously because it's the right thing to do, that might not be a powerful enough argument for some of the more conservative people in government. But if you say, you might be losing up to $23 billion a year by not ensuring their rights, you've got their attention. So when we look at all of the ways that exclusion harms, this is sort of the positive spin, right? The vision for inclusion. In all of these domains, so in political and civic participation, in education, health, personal security, prevention of violence, and economic well-being. In each of these domains, discrimination is real, and there's some documentation that it happens quite frequently, that it um, prevents people from engaging as equal citizens, from being productive members of society, and the attempt then to estimate that cost beyond just the out-of-pocket cost of seeking health care show those you know, 700 million to 23 billion dollars. And that's just India. So imagine what this looks like at the global scale and how much we're losing. Yeah? Again, this is from the UNDP index, which I think is really worth looking at. What I want you to pay attention to then are, are these domains. So political and civic participation, education, health, personal security, economic well-being. It looks a lot like this. The commitment from the United Nations to leave no one behind. With these 17 goals, you might guess which one's my favorite, right here, gender equality. What are these goals? Does anyone know? Really important. All the member countries of, all the member um, states of the United Nations have had to sign on to these. Ah, almost. The Millennium Development Goals, those have actually, they've been eclipsed now because they ended in 2015. Those were the goals that the countries agreed to achieve by 2015. We didn't do so well, yeah? But these are the new ones. They're the Sustainable Development Goals. So it's basically the MDGs that you mentioned, take two, right? Which we've just committed to last year, in 2015. Recognizing that we were pretty ambitious with the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals, and that we can be even more ambitious and hopefully can actually achieve some of these Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs. So you can look up more, but what I just wanted to call your attention to again is this idea that these inclusion domains for LGBTI people are the same as for women and girls, and for really all citizens of the world. That's what the UN is targeting, and they're very clear about it being leave no one behind. That's the goal. Because we're trying to get to equality, not just gender equality meaning between men and women, but gender equality for people of all sexual orientation and gender identity. And then think about those other overlapping risk categories we talked about, right? So it means older women. We didn't talk about age. It means poorer women and men. It means um, people all along those, you know, the different risk profiles that we discussed and ensuring equality for all. That's the only way that we can actually achieve these global development goals. And here are the resources that I mentioned. Voice and Agency, the book, the WDR, and a couple of um, specific resources that will be useful to you all if you're interested in um, reading more about violence against women and some of the tools that my team and I have developed. That's what these three are about. So thank you so much for your time today.
And I'm sorry, I've cut it pretty close to the end. We've got just a couple minutes. What a wonderful way for the 2016, <laughs> 17 public health seminars to be launched by you. Because it was a very seminar approach. Uh, for those who are taking one of the two courses, I remind you, you got a sign up sheet, which is in the land here. You might want to sign up. Number two, she isn't as engaging on the podium as she is in person. She's going to leave here and walk down the public health network. <laughs> and when you're invited to lunch, it's a modest buffet, but she'll be delighted to change the conversation with you at the public health offices. Any last questions before we adjourn? Did you have one? Sure. <coughs> Please. So I know we kind of focus on global stuff, but I'm kind of curious, um, as a researcher specifically related to violence against women and gender equality, mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about like current politics, and what do you see happening in the next four to eight years? Four to eight so you years. Specify yes. Which person? No. What do you kind of Fair question. Your hopes? So I don't know if everyone heard it, but the question is very delicately political. In the next four to eight years, <laughs> what might happen? So it should be obvious, based on all the things that you see, I care about and that I research on, and what my institution focuses on that gender and women's equality and LGBTI rights are central to what we believe in and the kind of work we do. Which means that we get funding from a number of donors, including the US government, to do that work. So the election is really important to us because we have two vastly different candidates. One who has worked on gender equality and women's rights for more than 30 years and the other who I think it's safe to say has not. I think we can anticipate that if Clinton is elected, we will be able to continue our business as usual and probably even better. We can expect more funding for this kind of work and probably even more progressive. I don't know that we can have the same expectations if Trump wins. So while ICRW as an institution does not support a candidate, I can tell you that for me, the prospect of having Clinton be the next president for four to eight years means that I will get to continue doing this work very openly and very proudly and with the support of our government. So that is certainly a much, um, oh, what's the word? A yellow brick road, right? It, it feels like a much brighter prospect than, than the opposite. Yeah? And it, we've seen this in the past with Republican and Democrat um, changes of the guard. You may have heard of the global gag rule, but what that, it has to do with abortion funding and whether any US government funding can go to clinics that provide abortions. It's not even that we are paying for abortions, but the clinic in a remote village in Niger also provides family planning and abortion and other kinds of health care. Every time the government switches from Republican to Democrat, that pendulum also swings. And the gag rule goes back into effect, meaning that providers who receive any kind of US government funding can't even speak about abortion as an option. And so we see how incredibly important it is for funding to have a progressive um, government. <laughs> That's, the, I think, the, the cleanest way to say it for me. Yeah, But it's going to make a big difference for us. And so we're bracing ourselves for what the transition looks like. And also hoping that Michelle Obama, in her post-White House life, will continue her Let Girls Learn program, which is focused on girls' education around the, the world, to help close some of those gaps that we've looked at. Right? So that's the big hope, is that she'll continue to lead the charge with the progressive lens. Yeah. Hi. You'll have to yell. Hi, I'm Alexia. I'm an MBA student. So just, I think you've talked a lot about the violence against women, and we see literature coming from women trying to address that. But I, so I probably didn't mention women, violence against other women. I wanted to see what your research has shown and why we as women contribute to support something that we're, you know, somewhat mm -hmm. So women committing violence against other women. Yeah, there is some literature on that, though I'd say it's predominantly looking still within the domestic sphere, and it's often mothers-in-law committing violence against their daughters-in-law. And so it's still very much based on this gendered inequality, right? That your role as the daughter-in-law is to serve my son, and because I had to go through this, you now have to go through it. And so the, the imbalance of power is really important there. I don't think there has been quite as much studied on any other form of violence that women might perpetrate against other women, in part because there's not a sense that that's as significant a problem on the global scale. I would say with the exception of bullying, 
which we see a lot of literature on particularly middle schools and high schools of, um, of girls bullying, sort of this mean girls phenomenon. So we do see a fair bit about that increasingly looking at cyber violence and the way that technology is being used to unfortunately facilitate that bullying. But I don't know if there's another kind that you are thinking of. There's none that come to mind for me that are, are prevalent problems. Did you say the workforce? The workforce? What kind of violence do you mean? Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that we would, we would classify that as a form of discrimination or even hostility, but I don't think that most workplace policies would count that under violence or harassment. Um, I don't know of any studies that specifically look at that. I think most that I've seen look broadly at the sort of the gender dynamics and the, the power hierarchy, and I don't know that they specifically delineate where it's women who are maintaining the power inequality at the, um, to the detriment of other women. But it could be an interesting study. Maybe that's one you can do. I will see you at the Annie Building for lunch. Yeah. Thank you. Sure.